Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Brownstone. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle, and you are listening to Numbers Don't Lie, where you learn to get out your feelings so you can make the best decisions for yourself, your family, and your business. Well, guys, I have a really special guest today, another doctor in public health, huh? You can, it's two of us on the show at the same time. So you definitely in for a treat. Um, we're going to be talking about data, of course, but nonprofits and public health are going to, it's going to all be mixed in there together because nonprofits and public health really are married. I know I said about like data and grants, data and marketing, but it's another one of those things where they really go hand in hand because a lot of our nonprofits, they're doing the work that the government isn't doing um, and that even larger institutions aren't doing. So they are, you know, educating our children. They are feeding the homeless. It's so many things that they're doing. And that all is a part of public health. So my special guest has a nonprofit herself, but we're going to talk from a lens of uh, Black data professionals in public health. I met her at a nonprofit conference, and she's just as much of a rock star as me. <laughs> toot toot. <laughs> so welcome to the Brownstone, Dr. Giselle. Hi, Dr. Michelle. Hey, Dr. Giselle. <laughs> <laughs> I love that our names rhyme, by the way. Oh, we're meant to be friends. That's all that means. <laughs> the first time you spoke, I was just like, I love her. She's amazing. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> oh, man. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I can't wait to have this conversation and let these people know about data. And it's not scary. I promise. It's not scary. It's not. So, Dr. Giselle, could you tell them a little bit about who you are? You're like, how'd you get here? Ooh, okay. So I'm going to give you the abbreviated version. Um, so I'm a doctor of public health with a focus in health education and prevention. Um, I'm also a clinical exercise physiologist and an epidemiologist, as well as a clinical nutrition specialist. So I'm I'm a mom, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a mentor. I do a lot of things as many of us black girls do a lot of things, you know, um, but I have a lot, I have a passion for public health for very personal reasons. Mm -hmm. um, most of which really stem from childhood. Like I, I experienced what it was like and not even just in my immediate family, but cousins and different things. I was exposed to extreme poverty. I had family members who lived in, in the hood. I had a cousin who was killed playing football um you know just playing football and having fun with friends just being being a teenager you know um my father died of diabetes complications one of my my mom's younger brother died of um a brain aneurysm after losing weight um like all of these different things that are so stigmatized to our community mm -hmm. these things are directly they have impacted me directly um, and I'm, I'm thankful for them, even though they were painful. Um, and I know it takes a lot to say, but I'm that much more even empowered to create research, to create programming, to partner with other organizations that are passionate about addressing this so that other families don't have to go through the things that I've experienced that other people I love have experienced. Um, and so that's, that's my story. And that is, that is my why. Um, and also, I don't want my child and other children like her to grow up having to experience these things, you know, so there's so many more I could, things I could say, but I'm going to stop there. That's good. I'm so sorry um, for your losses. It's ne and it's, and it's probably taking a turn, but like those things are, it's, it doesn't get easy with the next part. You know what I mean? Like I, I had, our family had a string of back to back years and it's just like, it literally does not get easy. You don't get used to the feeling of losing someone. Um, and I love that you are in prevention as well, because that was my focus. Like, first I wanted to do like uh, HIV, but then mm -hmm. I was like, well, I want to move it to something that's a little more, I don't say, I mean, that's preventable too, but I want to move away from viral infections um, and to things that touch us just so commonly in the black community, diabetes, heart disease, 
I mean, I would say high blood pressure runs in my family, but it stops with me, child. I have a really great blood pressure. I take care of myself. But it really is just like very practical things that we can do. But a lot of times our community either doesn't know about or doesn't know how to practice it in real life. So I love that you're in prevention as well. And you have like 45 degrees in certification. So how long were you in school? <laughs> So the Lord was good to, to your girl. He was good. Um, thankfully, honestly, I've always been really academically savvy. Um, and I actually graduated high school when I was 16. Wow. Um, I graduated from college when I was 19. And so um, I have a bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in chemistry. I have an MBA in healthcare administration. Um, I also have a master's degree in exercise physiology. And then I have my doctorate in public health. So I do have four degrees uh, that are earned. They were not credited. They were not honorary. I went to school and paid for the mug. Um, and then I have a lot of certifications, um, a lot of them um, through the through ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine. Um, I'm actually certified to work with people who have different comorbidities like cancer and diabetes and all kinds of other things. I am a, um, I'm actually getting ready to become a licensed dietitian as well. Um, so I'm a candidate right now, finishing all of my little supervised hours. Once I finish that, I'm done. Um, so what do you find time to do all this? <laughs> You know, that's a good question. I feel like when when what you do for a living and what your purpose is, your God-given purpose aligns, I feel like it just fits into my schedule because these are things that I genuinely enjoy. They genuinely bring me joy personally. Um, and yeah, it takes some dedication. I'm not going to lie, but yeah, it gets done. Well, I love that. So now people don't won't think I'm the busiest person in the world. <laughs> you can, and I believe in work life balance. I go out with my girlfriends. I you know, spend time with my daughter. I do all the things. I'm a big proponent of self care. I have my little massage appointments. All everything. If there is a way. It's just a matter about what you prioritize in life. You know, T no, put down the phone. Stop scrolling. So. You can buy some, you can get some, get some time back, put your phone down. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. And I'm here for it. So, you know, at the conference, I mentioned how I said nonprofit work is public health. Like, how do you see nonprofits fitting into like the larger picture of public health? Well, that is such, when you said that, I thought it was so profound. And I honestly had never heard anybody say it that way, but you're absolutely right. Because honestly, almost every single nonprofit I have worked with or I'm familiar with, um, whether it's super large and they have a multi-billion dollar budget or they're super small and they're just starting up, mm -hmm. they all work within to, or to address some form of social determinant of health mm -hmm. or one of the eight domains of well-being as a person. All of those things fall under public health. Yeah. Um, and so I thought it was very insightful for you to say that because, and just for the people who are listening and watching, um, social determinants of health are basically the conditions in which people are born, how we grow, how we live, how we work, how we age, just the entire lifespan mm -hmm. and all of the different things, the factors that impact the quality of those things. Mm -hmm. um, they include all the social economic factors like uh, social economic status, your education, where you live or your neighborhood, your physical environment. Do you have sidewalks? Do you have street lights? All of those things. Your employment. Like right. I, when I say I pay attention to that so much. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense to have any sidewalks. It's so residential. There's so many stores, like there's hotels where people live. Like, why don't they have like I'm I'm mad about the sidewalk thing, okay? <laughs> it's Girl, it wasn't until I was doing my postdoc in Baltimore and I was canvassing different neighborhoods, just getting to know them. Mm -hmm. You know, as a Black researcher, I need them to know like, hey, I'm a researcher, but I care about y'all. So I would literally walk the neighborhoods door to door. Hey, hi, I'm Dr. Martin. I would just introduce myself to yourself. I am a normal human being. I want you to get to know a researcher from a different lens. And I'm walking out there. There's no sidewalks. 
We're in Baltimore. We're not in Texas. We're not in somebody, some suburb. We're in Baltimore City. And I'm sitting here like trying not to get hit, just Girl. going door to door. And I'm like, how do they don't let them not mow the grass? Now you gotta walk in these tall weeds. I see it all the time when um where I live, like to me, it's a lot of it's heavily residential bus stops and children, you know, riding a bus, and it's people that are walking street slash grass. I'm like, this is so dangerous. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry y'all we got on a tangent but that stuff is important it really does say a lot about um what the state of the i'll say the state of your um economic area but also your health because it's said and i think oprah has like a a, a documentary or something where she says it but it's like it's well known in the uh, public health sector is that your zip code is a is a, one of the largest predictors of your health it's not the stuff that actually happens when you go to the visit is literally where you live, where you work, and where you play. And mm-hmm. most like Dr. Giselle was saying, a lot of those nonprofits are hitting one of those areas where there's literacy, financial literacy, education, um, some type of empowerment, whatever the case may be. Like I meet people that's like work with caregivers, like in their mental health. I mean, it's like the lifespan of people and these nonprofits are hitting something. And it's, I mean, I don't think they really, when I said in the moment, it was just came to me in a moment. Thank you, Lord. But it's something to be said. I think it needs to be said louder because I think a lot of nonprofits don't realize how powerful their work is. Looking for additional funding for your business? Have you considered applying for a grant? In 2022, there were 500,000 federal grants awarded. That's $6.5 trillion. It's time to get a piece of the pie. So we want to invite you to the Grant Success Unlocked Workshop, where we'll give you top-tier grant writing insight. It's happening on Saturday, September 23rd. Visit www.grantsuccessunlocked.com to register now before seats fill up. Previous attendees are still raving about it. Did we mention that it's free? Head to www.grantsuccessunlocked.com now. You're listening to Cityscape Radio, where local vibes meet timeless tunes. Be sure to check out all the things Cityscape and Brownstone on brownstoneworldwide.com. We have tons of things happening. We have a cruise coming up. I mean, the sky's the limit. So head on over to brownstoneworldwide.com. And I think part of that is we have to celebrate each other um, Mm -hmm. because some people are doing it simply out of passion and out of the love and just as we heard last week, you know, the passion and the love, that's great. That's wonderful. And I'm never going to downplay it, but we have to be very strategic in the support of each other and, and our businesses and working together, collaborating, not doing things in silos. Yeah. Um, and then also just being very intentional with the growth of our nonprofits the target demographic of our nonprofits. Like, who are we talking to? And so doing our due diligence as nonprofit founders and CEOs and workers and volunteers to be able to deliver the message that the community actually wants to receive. And truthfully, I think that me, because on the research side, the academic side, because I am also a professor, um, for, I, I didn't say that before, but um, my research. Thing we know about you now. 45 other things. <laughs> my research has been centered in health equity. And so within the health equity and then translating that over to policy, you know, we have to be very intentional about how we tell the story. And ultimately, nonprofits need to be skilled, extremely skilled at not just the data, but understanding the financial implications of what they're doing, yeah. because that is what gets politicians and policymakers to pay attention. That's good. Yeah, I was just, um, I was just on a call with someone, and she was telling me about the work she's doing, um, and it was it's great. Like a lot of the nonprofit work is great. Like whether it's great on paper, you say it out loud, but when it's time, like you said, to talk to politicians, even get funding from these banking institutions or other large institutions. It's like some of the stuff that we do that we care about, it's it's just like, well, why should it's like, unless you really start talking about money or something that's really close to home to them, it's just like, well, why should I care? 
So being able to associate the economic impact is so powerful and so true. So I love that. And a big part of that is, you know, using your data or whatever. But, <laughs> but no, that, that's so true. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So all my nonprofits out there, if you have not yet told your story um, in a way that's compelling, perhaps you want to, um, you know, integrate the economic impact of the work that you're doing. And you may not think it's that big of a deal, but trust me, it is. Even if you're educating students, that has a big, those have big implications towards the jobs that they get, how much they're able to contribute back to society, um, criminal justice records that are averted. Like it's so many different things that, uh, that are rooted in what you guys are doing. So we just have to do a better job of telling the story and the economic impact. Absolutely, yes, 100%. And, you know, one of the... Uh, one of the good, and we can get into this a little bit later. I'm not sure what else we're going to talk about today because you know how we just do when we get together. Um, but I would advise all nonprofit owners, and even if you're doing anything in the community, get to know the people who are in your academic institutions who are doing translational research, CBPR, community-based participatory research, um, implementation science research. These are the buzzwords for the researchers who are going to be intentionally looking for people just like you. Yeah. So just like you want to connect with them, they want to connect with you because a huge part of the success of their research depends on partnership with people like you. Mm -hmm. That's real, especially if you represent um, and serve black and brown communities. A lot of, you know, research that don't look like research like that don't look like us, they recognize that they can't just go into our communities anymore and do something like they have to partner. So that community based participatory participatory research. Girl, I was talking to Kim O'Neill and I was trying to find that phrase. I was like community based and I knew participant participation. I could not say it, but that's what I was talking about. But a lot of these um, organizations, they want to do research. but They know they can't do it alone. They don't know anybody in these communities. They can't just go in there, you know, with this white savior complex. Like they just can't. So like, I love that you say that they need you just as much as you need them. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's actually a project I'm working on right now. <laughs> okay. So look, we probably got time for one more question away. We going, <laughs> but that's okay. I, look, I can have you back again. <laughs> hey, whenever you are ready, sis, I'm here. So, um, in your opinion, what is the value of using data when you're a nonprofit? Like, will it really impact their ability to get funding? Because I know that's a big thing. They're like, all right, Michelle, you're talking all this stuff. What a money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Long story short, absolutely yes. If you didn't take anything else from today, get to know data. Don't let it scare you. Mm -hmm. So, first thing first, data can be qualitative or quantitative. So me and myself, I'm what's called a mixed methodologist. I do both. I like to tell the story. There's value in the story, especially when you get into the community and you are allowing the community to help drive the research initiative. A lot of times researchers, they, they honestly try to answer questions that are of zero or little interest to the community. That's real. But listen, so, you like me, you just trying to get that degree. <laughs> girl, that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole separate podcast right there. <laughs> just trying to, I just want to defend this on my dissertation. It not take 20 years, please. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, that that's that. But no, but for real, for real, we really need your voice. And the way that we tell our stories is through data, whether it's through words or it's through numbers. And I truly believe that both of them together help create an impact that is so solid that you it's it's irrefutable. You know, you're you're looking at health outcomes. Okay, that's one thing. You're looking at the um maybe ER readmissions for your area if you're health related. You're looking at the number of practitioners that are in your area that provide mental health services, or you're looking at the amount of, of substance use and abuse in your county or in a particular zip code, whatever it is, 
that tells your story. That tells you why your services are relevant in the first place. Yeah. So you need to do that regardless of how big you are, how small you are. This makes you compelling. This makes you, you, you can't say no to somebody who comes with their data and they yeah. know that. Yeah. What, what can you say? What, what can you say? Like, unless you, your mission just doesn't align with theirs. If you I can tell that story, I mean, you a force. You are totally a force to be reckoned with. So, I, But I love what you said, don't be afraid of it. And I feel like nonprofit leaders, as well as business owners, they have been afraid of it. It's just like, you know, I made that joke during the conference, but it's so true. Like, oh, I was bad at math in, in like middle school. And it's just like, now all of a sudden, I don't I don't touch it at all. I'm like, okay, let's let's get over that real quick. The, the math that you need is is not algebra for the most part is a lot of times it's basic addition and subtraction you allow the, the the spreadsheet to do a lot of the calculations for you but you need to understand what's going on in your business and i think in your organization like when i say business i'm talking about both small business owners and nonprofits you have to know what's going on in your business and the reason why is because you're the owner you're the ceo you're the leader you're in charge so if you have all these things happening, these programs happening, you're doing this, and you're doing that, but you don't know um, how much you're bringing in. You don't know if it's effective. You don't know how much it costs per child to run this program, how much it costs per lead, all this stuff. And you just doing stuff, you're going to end up bankrupt or not having enough to pay your um, program coordinators or the people that, you know, actually run the program. Because it's like, well, I, I don't do that. Like I, and I know I'm probably exaggerating, but you do have some people that really do shy away so much and even trying to completely pass it off. Mm -hmm. It's okay to bring in someone like Dr. Zell or myself into your business, but you cannot be totally hands off with what is happening in your business. You need to have a high level understanding of what's going on. So again, don't be afraid of it. Take it head on. Get somebody like me or Dr. Giselle to walk you through it but you can't run from it okay it's that if you run from it your money the the funding will run from you okay <laughs> i like that that's real though and you i i so you know i have a, a for-profit business as well that's the entire reason i did my mba mm -hmm. because i wanted to be responsible for the financial health of my business and know what's happening and i think sometimes ceos are just or founders are just like, oh, well, I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. Yes, but honestly, it kind of became your area of expertise when you took this on. And, and yes, it's a service. And yes, we are so proud of you for taking a step out on faith and doing all the things that God has told you to do. Yes, absolutely. But with that comes responsibilities. Absolutely. And so let's prepare you to handle the responsibility responsibilities appropriately but you can't just like, you know, for those of you who have children who are just like, oh, but I didn't know. Mm -mm. We talked about this last week. Nothing has changed from this week. You know, just, it's the same thing. You have to remember that, like, like Dr. Michelle said, it, it influences your cost effectiveness. If you have staff, can you retain your staff? Can you pay them? It is imperative to your credibility. Yeah. And a lot of nonprofits fail, not just for these other things, but we don't really talk about it that much, but it's a lack of transparency. Yes, what I are do. you truly doing with your money? Because listen, yeah. people want to know now. It's so many people. Girl, so many people going going down for them PPP uh, scams. They was taking money, buying stuff. And there's so there is this negative stigma if I give my money to someone. And I mean, it's, it's a current case going on right now, current debacle on social media. Uh, with this whole fund it was like a for like you know a black fund real estate fund and there's potential and i believe it's substantial uh evidence of gross misuse of the money and wow. so you know that's out there so there's always going to be a stigma that you're you're taking my money you're buying a boat you're doing this and you have to get ahead of it and show people like no we have these programs we're impacting this we pay this many people like you have to get ahead of that narrative Mm hmm it's crazy that ppp i don't know it's totally unrelated as a business owner like the first round i didn't even qualify quote unquote because i did it the right way mm -hmm. and i'm like i actually have a business and i actually oh, made money 
And I didn't qualify, but I know people who don't even have a business. Didn't even have a business. They gonna out here getting coins, okay? And I'm going to jail right now. So unfortunately. Anywho, before we run out of time, Dr. Giselle, because we're we gonna have to definitely have her back. I'm sure the listeners have enjoyed you. Shout out. We're gonna, we gonna have to make a part two. We're gonna make a part two, y'all. But could you tell them a little bit about your nonprofit and perhaps we can spend a little more time there next time? Absolutely. Yes. So I do have a for-profit um, that's called the Viv Wellness Academy, but we'll leave that part alone for now. I am also the founder and the CEO of the Hilda Public Collaborative, where we connect and provide culturally relevant services and programs that integrate all eight dimensions of well-being to improve chronic disease outcomes in communities of color. That is not just here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That is all over the country. Um, I have a Heart for the Washington, D.C. area, Baltimore area, Atlanta area. These are areas that literally gave me my start professionally. And I have not forgotten about you. I love you, Dallas, Fort Worth, your home. You will always be my number one. Um, but right now, one of the biggest projects that I'm working on is a database that actually connects the community and nonprofit owners with clinicians, with policymakers who are interested in different areas where you can literally just search. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm looking for a researcher at UT Southwestern who does this. Boom. I'm looking for a nonprofit owner who focuses on recidivism. Boom. There you go. You have their contact information. You can connect right, right there. And so it helps bridge this gap, this these silos, these information silos, and it helps you get your data. So that's awesome. And since you were talking um, go ahead and tell us how to find you so we can learn more about you, your nonprofit, or your for-profit. Absolutely. So I tried to be kind of consistent with my my uh, handles, but you can find me on my website, drgiselmartin.com, J-A-S-E-L-M-A-R-T-I-N, just in case you were wondering how to spell my name. Um, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, I am Dr. Jazzy Fit. That's D-R-J-A-Z-Z-Y-F-I-T on all of my social media platforms. I'm going to ask about this fit next time because you know I teach Zumba, so we have to circle back. We got to circle back. So we got so much more to talk about. We will be like a part seven. <laughs> and even know that about you. Mm -hmm. I love to sing, but I also love to dance. So guys, thank you for joining us on this episode of Numbers Don't Lie on Cityscape Radio. I've been your host, Dr. Michelle, and you can find me on all things Mogul Beginnings. That's M-O-G-U-L, Mogul Beginnings. That's Instagram, Facebook. I scroll a little bit on TikTok. You know, I mean, I'm out there on Twitter, but, and also don't forget to register for the upcoming Grant Success Unlock Workshop, where you learn how to write winning grants so you can get that coinage and tell your story better. Alrighty, guys, until next time, see ya. Where are all the people that say, well, if I had more money in my business, I would do this. Or if I had funding, me and my nonprofit, we could do that. If that's you, come here. I have something that you are going to need. It is a Grant Success Unlock Workshop. The last time we did it, we had a cost, but we removed all barriers to make sure you get what you need. My partner and I, we have a mission to help as many entrepreneurs and nonprofit leaders fund their mission. If that's you, I want you to register now at grantsuccessunlock.com. Do not wait another day. Do not wait another moment. Do not let your mission be put on hold. Visit www.grantsuccessunlock.com. Mogul Beginnings Data Consulting helps nonprofits and small businesses strategize, optimize, and scale by unleashing the power of their data. So if you're ready for your data to be unleashed to help your business tell beautiful stories, connect today by logging on to mogulbeginnings.com. That's mogulbeginnings.com.